Electromagnetic interference, also known as EMI, is probably one of the most interesting and misunderstood topics in all of electrical engineering. In fact, many engineers will refer to it as either a black magic or dark art because it has a reputation for being very mysterious and difficult to deal with. Today's video is the first in a series I am titling EMI from the Ground Up where I am going to teach you everything I know about electromagnetic interference. My goal with this series is to pull back the curtain on EMI and uncover a lot of the mysteries associated with it. By the end of this series, you will be able to properly diagnose and solve EMI problems all on your own, as well as design your circuit boards to significantly reduce the amount of EMI problems you have to begin with. EMI is something that is present at pretty much every level of electrical engineering, so no matter what industry or field you're in, you're going to have to deal with it at some point. So I think there's going to be a lot of value for you, no matter what type of electrical engineer you are. Before we go any further, feel free to check out the description. There will be a lot of links there that I think you'll find helpful. And now, let's get right into it. So today's video is going to be an introduction to the world of EMI. We are going to cover some basic topics such as what it is, how it works, and some other important topics that you'll need to know before you start your journey to becoming an EMI engineer. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is what is EMI? Now, if you ask ChatGPT to define EMI, it will tell you it is a disturbance that is generated by external sources that affects an electrical circuit through electromagnetic induction, electrostatic coupling, or conduction. And while I think that description is very accurate, I don't think it's particularly helpful to someone who is a beginner. If I were to describe EMI in my own words, I would say that electromagnetic interference is when the electronic signals generated by one circuit interfere with the operation of another circuit. This can either be through the air which is known as radiated EMI, or through conductors that the circuits both have in common, such as wires and PCB traces. And this is known as conducted EMI. One of the best examples I can think of when talking about EMI is that annoying staticky buzzing sound that you'll sometimes hear in speakers even when no sound is playing. This is caused by electromagnetic interference disrupting the electronic circuits that control the speakers, which causes them to produce audible noise. The noise you hear coming out of the speaker can also be seen as a voltage signal using an oscilloscope. There is interference just like this happening all the time in every single electronic circuit that has ever existed. So it is important that we understand EMI so that we know how to deal with it and prevent it from wreaking havoc on our devices. So before we get into specifics of how to deal with EMI, let's talk about the different types of EMI. So as we just mentioned, there are two main categories for EMI. It's going to be radiated and conducted. And each of these categories has its own unique characteristics and properties. Radiated EMI can be understood as the wireless type of EMI because it propagates through the magnetic waves that are generated by these electronic circuits. If you're familiar with my Power Electronics from the Ground Up series, then you'll know about Faraday's law and how a wire carrying current will generate a magnetic field. Now in the case of switch mode power supplies, this is a good thing that we harness in order to do the power conversion. But in the case of radiated EMI, it is a bad thing that is the result of unwanted magnetic fields that are being generated by our electronic circuits. And then conducted EMI is the type of EMI that is carried along the conductors of the electronic circuits, AKA the wires and the PCB traces. This type of EMI is the real problem because it is what actually causes the circuit to malfunction. Going back to the speaker noise analogy, it is the conducted EMI that is making its way onto the speaker wires and causing that buzzing sound to emit. Conducted EMI can originate from either circuits that are connected through a common conductor. For example, maybe they share a common ground plane or are connected to the same power supply, or it can be caused by radiated EMI whose magnetic field propagates and induces a voltage on the other electronic circuit. So this is why even though the conducted EMI is the dangerous one, we also care about radiated EMI because it is what can turn into conducted EMI. And this is also the main reason why if you've ever seen a circuit design 
then you'll see a ton of capacitors just placed everywhere on the board. And the reason for this is because engineers want to be extra sure that their circuit is not susceptible to a lot of noise. So they put a lot of filtering caps on the board. So in addition to radiated and conducted, there are two other ways that we can classify EMI. And that is differential mode versus common mode. So for differential mode, you can best think of it as the noise that appears between any pair of conductors or wires. It is the unwanted AC portion of a DC signal. One good example would be the ripple voltage that we see on the output of a switch mode power supply. As we know, the power supply will emit a DC voltage, but there will be some ripple component associated with it that is caused by the switching of the MOS. If left unchecked, differential mode noise can conduct to other circuits locally, or in some cases, it could propagate through a magnetic field and show up as radiated emissions. Common mode EMI is the noise signal that appears equally on two conductors or PCB traces. You can kind of think of it like differential mode EMI, where we are measuring with respect to earth ground. So in the example of the switch mode power supply, we would see this common mode noise show up on your ground rail as well as your positive voltage rail. And this would be with respect to earth ground. The way we would detect common mode noise would be by measuring the positive voltage rail and the ground rail with respect to earth ground. Common mode noise can also conduct to other parts of the circuit and present problems locally, as well as propagate through a magnetic field and show up as radiated emissions. So just to review, there are basically four main types of EMI. You can have radiated EMI in the form of either differential mode or common mode, as well as conducted EMI, which can also take the form of either differential mode noise or common mode noise. It is important to know which specific type of EMI you're dealing with because that will affect how you mitigate and control it. So the next thing I want to talk about are going to be the regulations and standards that pertain to EMI. All throughout the world, there are different regulations that put a limit on how much EMI your device is allowed to produce. The purpose of these regulations and standards is to allow different devices to exist safely in the same environment. Going back to the speaker noise example, just imagine if instead of a speaker that we were talking about, it was some super sensitive piece of medical equipment or something super important, maybe like a carbon monoxide detector, and we were interfering with that circuit's ability to function. Imagine how catastrophic that would be for the world if important electronic devices like these were not able to function because of the electromagnetic interference being produced by nearby electronics. That is why complying with these standards is not only a legal obligation, but a crucial step in ensuring the safety and reliability of electronic devices in our daily lives. When it comes to specific regulations, depending on where in the world your device is, you will have to adhere to a different regulating body's standards. For example, in America, you have to comply with the FCC's rules and regulations regarding electromagnetic interference, which are detailed in part 15 of their code of regulations. Depending on your device's intended use, you would have to comply with a specific subsection of rule 15. For example, subpart C calls out standards for intentional radiators, which would be like RF transmitters, and wireless communications devices. It's pretty common to test one device to multiple standards to ensure that it can be used anywhere in the world without any problems. In general though, most of the standards around the world are pretty similar, so testing to additional standards isn't that much extra work. The way you verify that your device is meeting these standards is by testing it in a certified EMI chamber, also referred to as an anechoic chamber. This is a room that has been specially built to absorb electromagnetic waves. So not only can no electromagnetic waves get out of the chamber, but none of the electromagnetic waves from outside the chamber can get in. So actually, if you walk in there with carrying a cell phone, you'll lose cell phone reception. The purpose of the EMI chamber is to create an environment that is free from any outside influence so that the engineers can adequately test their devices to make sure that they're meeting the regulations and standards. 
There are separate tests that you have to run for radiated emissions and conducted emissions, and they each have their own unique test setup procedure. With radiated emissions testing, there is a calibrated antenna that is positioned a specific distance away from the device under test. Usually it's three meters or 10 meters. As part of the test, there is an automated process that adjusts both the antenna's height and polarity to find the maximum emission levels. The device under test also sits on a large turntable that can rotate 360 degrees to measure emissions from all angles. A spectrum analyzer is connected to the antenna and it measures and records the emissions data. The regulations will call out a specific frequency range that you have to test across. So the automated test process will usually just cover those frequencies. For radiated emissions, it is typically 30 megahertz up to one gigahertz, but it can be higher depending on which standard you're testing to. With conducted emissions testing, a piece of equipment known as a Line Impedance Stabilization Network, or LISTEN for short, is connected between the wall outlet and the device under test. Now is a good time to mention that if your device doesn't ever plug into the wall, then congratulations, you don't have to do conducted emissions testing because there's nothing to test. For conducted emissions testing, there is a separate frequency range that you have to test across, which is usually 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. And this is pretty universal across all devices. So in general, it's a good idea to become familiar with the test process for both radiated and conducted emissions, as well as the specific standards and regulations that pertain to your device. That way you can better interpret the data that these EMI tests are giving you. So now that we know what EMI is, how it works, let's talk about how to deal with it. So in general, there are two main points during the product development cycle that you can address EMI. And that is either at the very beginning of your design phase or at the very end. And this might be rather intuitive, but dealing with EMI at the beginning of the design phase is by far the better choice because you have a lot more options for reducing emissions and much better control over your design. Waiting until the end of the design phase to address EMI can be both difficult and very costly. So when designing for EMI, you can kind of think about addressing it on three levels. At the system level, the PCB level, and the circuit level. Dealing with EMI at the system level usually includes things such as adding ferrites to cables, rerouting your cable assemblies, or adding shielding to your cables. As we mentioned earlier, none of these options are particularly effective, especially when compared to the other two we're about to discuss, and they can also add a lot of cost to your device. At the circuit level, there are many different things you can use to address both your conducted and radiated emissions. Things such as RC snubbers, ferrite beads, and filters are just some examples of techniques you can employ to reduce your emissions. At the circuit level, you also have the added advantage of being able to deal with common mode noise and differential mode noise separately, unlike with the system level. So this gives you a lot more flexibility in your design. At the PCB level, you also have a ton of different techniques and strategies you can use to reduce both your conducted and radiated emissions. Things such as component placement, trace routing, and layer stack up are just a few of the many examples of strategies and techniques you can employ to reduce your emissions. The main advantage with PCB design changes is that they add virtually zero cost to your design so you can experiment and try out many different approaches relatively risk-free. As you can see, there is just so much to learn about EMI and I'm really looking forward to sharing what I know with you. My plan for this is to be a living series, so I will be constantly updating it as I learn new things or develop better ways to explain old concepts. But for now, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover in this introductory video. Thank you so much if you made it to the end and hopefully I will see you in the next one.